Hi, the, the following notes are a follow-up to the Declaration of Independence, which we've discussed in class over the past week. Uh, this is just an opportunity to talk a little bit about the Declaration of Independence, the different parts or chunks of the Charter Document of Freedom that is conveniently over my shoulder behind me. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the Declaration of Independence. Um, in class, we said it was a little bit funny that John Adams uh, wrote a letter to his wife, Abigail um, Adams, on July 3rd, 1776, uh, telling her that uh, he thought it would be awesome and would definitely be appropriate for the American people to remember July 2nd, 1776, as the true day of independence and freedom here in North America for this new country, these United States of America. And we said that that was a little bit funny and laughable because we don't have 2nd of July cookouts. We don't have 2nd of July fireworks. And that's what John Adams really thought they were going to do. Now, that's not because he's bad with dates, and he's not because he doesn't understand what the Declaration of Independence was. However, John Adams was convinced at the time of uh, writing that letter to his wife that the resolution to actually declare independence was the most important part at that point. You see, that was the Second Continental Congress on July 2nd, approving the Lee Resolution, a delegate from Virginia, to formally make the official change between reconciliation and peace and a desire to actually create a new country. This is the moment where we as a people, colonists in British North America, decide that the time to say we're sorry, the time to actually um, fight to have some type of equal part in the English Empire, it's over. It's gone. It's past finalized most recently in their minds with the rejection of the Olive Branch Petition and of continued attacks um, by British regular forces against the colonists who are now going to be American citizens. And that this birth certificate, or world's greatest breakup letter, as we've talked about it in class, was only a small step, and John Adams also includes in that letter to his wife Abigail, that the hardest part of issuing a Declaration of Independence would be backing it up, um, that mutual pledge to one another that they were willing to put their life, their fortunes, which means their money and their, their property and anything that they could ever profit from this experience, as well as their sacred honor, and that's their bond together, that they would uh, work together to make sure that this Declaration of Independence is not just a piece of paper. Because in history, nobody remembers the losers, and if these... Uh, rebels had, had not been able to truly gain their independence by defeating the British, then no one would talk about them very much at all today. It's only because they were able to win this American Revolution that this document means anything at all. So let's talk about this Declaration of Independence, and it's probably going to be a good idea for you to have either a digital version pulled up on your screen as we talk about this, or have your binder open, or at least a copy online on your laptop, so that we can make note of a couple things. One, we said this is not just a document. It's not just a long list. This is a persuasive letter, a persuasive letter that was meant to be read by King George III specifically, uh, by Parliament specifically, but, but more importantly than that, it's meant to be read by the larger global community. We want this to end up in the hands of people in France and in Spain and the Netherlands, around the world. We want this to end up in the hands of American citizens who don't know they're American citizens yet, because this is going to be a persuasive tool to allow other countries to evaluate whether or not these Americans are even worth getting involved with. Uh, if we can lay out our case in front of the global community, quite possibly we might be able to get allies involved in the fight, helping us fight against Great Britain, actually proving that we can have real independence rather than just talking about it. And furthermore, here in the United States of America, it's important for citizens to get their hands on this so that they can see what this is supposedly all about to evaluate whether or not they're going to pick and choose the side of patriots and fight for independence or remain loyalists or Tories here in uh, America now uh, still fighting on behalf of King George and the Parliament. It starts off with the first section of the preamble or introductory paragraph and this is just the explanation to the world 
that in the course of human history, sometimes it becomes necessary for a group of people to break off and form their own country. That's that when in the course of human events poetic intro. This is them laying out their idea that they are going to break away. The second part, the most important part of laying their case in the Declaration of Independence is this next paragraph called the Declaration of Natural Rights. This is where the thesis statement actually exists and it's important for us to know the main topic idea of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's your thesis statement of the entire Declaration of Independence, that these people uh, have self-evident truths, meaning they, their eyes have been opened and going for, forth from this point. They could not be blinded anymore. And what are they... Uh, have their eyes open to? Well, that they have a sense of equality that had been denied to them, that there would not be any type of class system or nobility or, or paying respect to a king anymore, that true power lies with the people. And they know this because their creator endowed or gifted them with rights that allow them to have this opportunity, that among these uh, rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This seems easy for us to recite or to think about, uh, but for these people in 1776, this would have been earth-shattering um, ideas for them to be thinking about, that power lies in the people, that it's not necessary to have a king, that uh, people have these rights given to them by God, uh, and it's, it's self-evident, meaning that they don't need to be recognized by a government, that it's the people that actually empower the government. Furthermore, um, the next follow-up to the thesis statement is that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This reinforces the Magna Carta promise from 1215, and it also shows that the only, the only reason that governments exist are to protect the rights of the people in its most simple form. The rest of the Declaration of Natural Rights is going to be embracing some of the ideas of John Locke. It's also going to have some of the spirits of Thomas Paine in here, um, which is radical at the time because he was seen in this as this people's revolutionary. But it wraps up by letting the world know that they aren't just going to break away for any light reasons, and they know that people are bound to suffer, and they don't just go to war over little things. And they're going to show that to the world that this is because of a pattern of repeated injustices, a system of tyranny, um, and complete corruption and total abuse from the King of England. They need to present evidence. Now, the, the biggest chunk of the Declaration of Independence is this list of grievances, complaints, accusations, and charges primarily against King George III. And that's crazy to think about because just months before this, we had sent the Olive Branch petition um, still hoping that the king somehow was not guilty of being involved in this scheme um, or conspiracy against these Americans. Now we are going to be slandering him with charges, slandering from his point of view. The, the charges are going to feel fair from our point of view. You know that these charges are referring to the King of England, King George III, because they start off so commonly, he has, meaning he has done something to hurt the Americans, or he has done something to limit the Americans in their ability. And this is this case. Now we said that these charges were uh, not just hodgepodge together. They were specifically selected for a reason. The primary author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, would have carefully put together things that he knew that average Americans would have been able to associate with. So the things that the King and Parliament have done specifically over the past 13 years since the end of the French and Indian War to limit their economic abilities, to limit their political rights, and to specifically hurt them. So without naming specific acts of legislation or acts or proclamations of the king, Jefferson lists grievances that these people could connect with. 
things like um, specifically um, making it more difficult for them to buy goods, to participate fully in the British Empire economic system, or to force them to have to allow British soldiers to stay in their homes or pay a tax to have them housed in their communities. And even some things in here that are ticky-tack, like the Quebec Act, allowing these French Canadians to have a greater piece of the pie and allow them to participate more fully in the British Empire system. These American citizens would have been able to read the Declaration of Independence, whether it be something like a broadside publication or pamphlet, or even something that would have been printed in their local newspapers, and they would have been able to say, yeah, I do remember that, or, well, that didn't happen in my former colony, my current state, but I remember that it happened in Massachusetts or Pennsylvania. So this, in some senses, it can be a form of propaganda because it can further unity among these American citizens because they'll say, wow, I, I guess we really are in this together. Okay? And it also builds a case for the global community that this is not something that's automatic, it's not a light or transient cause, that these Americans have put up with quite a bit, and that it would be a worthy effort for them to, to break away and for the rest of the global community to recognize them. The last section before the signatures is the resolution of independence. This is the only verb of the entire document. It does two things. One, it announces to Great Britain that any formal legal uh, ties have been severed, which means they're no longer paying respect, paying taxes, or paying allegiance to the royal crown or the royal parliament. It also announces to the greater world that they're there. We're willing to sit at the big boy table. We're going to sit there. We are going to be the United States of America. You have the opportunity to do something awesome. You can treat us like we're really a country. That right there, when that starts to happen in the, in the greater sense from the global community, and later on when Great Britain herself, when the, when the royal lion, Great Britain, will recognize the United States as a sovereign country, that's when the Declaration of Independence really rings true and is more than just a document, more than just a persuasive letter or essay. It's actually something that did happen when the King of England and Parliament will be forced to recognize us after the American Revolution. That's when we're going to really be a country. The last thing that it does is that this is the embedded promise to one another. And um, this connects really to the sentiments that John Adams includes in his letter to his wife Abigail when he knows that de declaring independence is easy. Fighting for it, winning independence is going to be hard. This acknowledgement that blood will be spilt and it really will take this firm reliance, this mutual pledge on one another, people putting their lives on the line, their fortunes on the line, and their sacred honor. Will they turn their backs on one another? Will it be so easy to go back to England? Or are they in this together no matter what? Knowing very well that if someone was going to bet on this, that more people would bet on Great Britain with the strongest army and navy in the world, a strong economy, and the ability to fight with trained professional soldiers, I take that bet. I would not bet on the Continentals who are going to be led by this George Washington fellow with a bunch of unexperienced militiamen, officers that most, more recently had been businessmen or farmers or lawyers than military officers. I wouldn't bet on them. The last section is the signatures. We said that the first copy of the Declaration of Independence most likely only had the signature of the chairman or president of the meetings, and that would have been John Hancock, and that all these other signatures would have been added probably up to a month later, and that's why some are missing, because when they voted for declaration, uh, they were there and didn't get a chance to sign an official copy. And later, when they tried to get everyone back together, it wasn't possible at the time. Uh, I just want to make a few remarks real quick on the Committee of Five. It's important for us to know the names of these men, where they came from, and what they were responsible for doing. Obviously, Thomas Jefferson, history denotes this 33-year-old man at the time of, of the Second Continental Congress as the primary author and lead architect of this document. Um, 
there's there's a way that there's there's two different ways to look at this. Some people look at Jefferson as this brilliant writer and brilliant thinker, uh, as someone that put this together, and uh, he should be given a ton of credit. I do think that Jefferson, at a very 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 young age, is able to put together a sound legal argument. But but let's be honest. A lot of the things that he includes in here have been mentioned before in some previous documents, some previous petitions, not only by the Second Continental Congress, but even the former colony and current state of Virginia had put together language like this. So he kind of borrows from a lot of really quality historical documents, and he borrows from a lot of um, quality historic writings and thinkings. So he does this in order to put together the best possible persuasive letter, persuasive essay. I do think that there's a lot of individual creativity in here by Jefferson. If this was something that he just ripped off and copied um, and stole from other people, then I don't think he would have been upset when the Second Continental Congress went through and did revisions. Um, it, it tore Jefferson to shreds when he saw the full body of the Second Continental Congress read his rough draft out loud, something that he thought was really good, uh, really awesome, and they tore it to shreds through peer editing. And that's why we talk to each other about, uh, always in class, about not taking it personal that the group is trying to better or improve your document or decide as a group on things that uh, they valued more than others. And there are some controversial things that were, were removed, most notably Jefferson's writings that would have blamed in the list of grievances, the transatlantic slave trade on uh, the British Empire specifically, that slavery existed in the former colonies and now current states because it was introduced as part of a British governmental and commercial enterprise and had been continued to be reinforced and encouraged to this day in 1776 because of the king and parliament specifically. This is Jefferson acknowledging that slavery is not great and that it was put there by the king and parliament. Now, that one right there, probably pretty tough to prove, as are some of the other charges in there. It was removed more than likely to make sure that some of the uh, delegates from some of the southern colonies that are going to become states with this document so that they sign off on it. Um, they did not want the institution of slavery to be mentioned at all, or at least mentioned in a negative light or capacity, because they needed to hold on to it because it was the base of their economic system of privilege and prosperity in their geographic region. So that gets cut out. But a lot of other stuff, too. Um, some simple proofreading and pu punctuation. Also, some things being changed here, there are words. And that just ate up Thomas Jefferson, um, who really thought this is one of the best things that he did in his entire life, and to do it at such a young age of 33. You've got the other big two on the committee, John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. These guys not only helped Jefferson with editing his rough draft, but they, they existed as a sounding board. Um, Benjamin Franklin knew that it was going to be important um, for a Virginian to be doing this. Jefferson was known as an excellent writer and thinker, but not a great speaker. And he didn't have to speak at all with a written Declaration of Independence. I think there was some doubt early on by, by John Adams uh, that whether or not Jefferson was a good choice. I think Jefferson really shows Adams here that he could be counted on. This is the beginning of a friendship between Adams and Jefferson that is going to be great until uh, they get involved in presidential elections and politics, but they do remain great friends um, to their deathbed, and we'll get into that more in the new year in 2016. Adams comes from Massachusetts. He's got this strong legal background of being a an attorney and a lawyer. He wants to make sure that the argument is specific and it does outline them a the legitimate reason that they can break away and do so appropriately. Um, Franklin's a guy that's got a lot of the expertise. He's been around. He's representing Pennsylvania. He's been around since the first Confederation opportunities with the Albany Plan of Union in 1754. After the Declaration of Independence, he's going to pack his bags and he's going to head to France. And his number one goal is going to be to get the King of France and the people of France to adopt the American cause for liberty and to send over troops and money and resources to take advantage of a rivalry that is not new 
France versus Great Britain is nothing new, but France wasn't just going to jump in and help the Americans. They wanted to make sure that it was worth the bet, and that's why Franklin's going to be like, okay, I got a declaration. I'm going to France. See you guys later. The other two people that are important to, to remember are Robert Livingston of New York. Um, on the Declaration of Independence, his signature is not there. He's on the Committee of Five, this Gang of Five. His signature is not there. Philip Livingston is not Robert Livingston. In fact, um, Robert did not get a chance to sign the original version um, because he was back in New York. But he is very much involved in the process as the, the automatic light sensors have gone on. That's my cue that I've gone on a little bit too long. Um, he he uh, helps out with this later on. He will be very important in, in the Industrial Revolution in the United States. We'll talk about that. And then the last one is Roger Sherman of Connecticut, who doesn't get a ton of uh, historical remembrance for the Declaration of Independence, but he's going to be extremely important in helping this specific document um, get adopted. And then later, he's going to be incredibly crucial for the U.S. Constitution to be adopted. So those are your Committee of Five. Some final remarks on the Declaration of Independence before I sign off. Um, at the time, this was a huge gamble. Um, but today, the Declaration of Independence is not only remembered as our birth certificate, our charter birth certificate, a charter of freedom, but it is something that shows that we have made the break from reconciliation efforts and have fully transitioned to the cause of independence. That doesn't mean that every person in North America was supporting the cause of independence, but it does mean now that there's no turning back, and the only way to guarantee our freedom is to fight for it now. And people would have to take sides because it was about to get very real. Later on, the Declaration of Independence will inspire political movements, uh, anything from the women's suffrage movement to the African-American civil rights movement of the 20th century. Um, but even before that, it's going to, it is going to um, inspire the people of Haiti to declare independence from France. It will inspire the French people themselves to get rid of a king and create a republic. Even today, people look towards the Declaration of Independence for inspiration. It's more than just something that we use to uh, cut out small quotes and sound bites for during political seasons. This is the basis of our founding. It will give legitimacy to our U.S. Constitution, and even today should we be remembered as the most important of our charter documents for freedom. Thank you, and have a great day.